Whenever something is lost, in order to find it, you need to do two things. You need to look where it is, and you need to look with something that can find it. We know where to look for Amelia Earhart's plane, and we need a tool to search. In this case, we're going to use the Remus Autonomous Underwater Vehicle operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. So as uh, Dave Jordan explained, the main tool for this survey uh, in the search for Amelia, uh, we're going to utilize the Remus 6000. Uh, my name is Greg Packard. I'm one of the uh, technicians on board that runs the vehicle. And uh, what we hope you gain here is an understanding of the vehicle itself um, and the sensors that we're going to utilize to search and then identify uh, the aircraft on the bottom. It's very torpedo shaped. That gives us the efficiency of swimming through the water. Um, on AUVs, one thing that we are limited is the amount of power that we can carry. So unlike an ROV, which is cabled to the surface and has this power plant, a ship, sitting above it, AUVs, they have to provide their own power and logic. Um, so that gives them a limited time on the bottom, but they're also very efficient once they get to the bottom. If you see a video of the vehicle recovery, you'll see that one section of the nose actually pops off. And this is our recovery float, which is connected to the vehicle with a line which enables us to haul the vehicle on board after its mission. Um, otherwise, it's a simple lifting and towing bale, which we use in the deployment process. As we move back on the vehicle, we have a series of two uh, appendages. One is an antenna, which when we're on the surface, gives us GPS fixes, it gives us the ability to have Wi-Fi control to the vehicle. So we're not only talking to the vehicle over the Wi-Fi to transfer data back and forth and get an idea of its health and status, but we can actually drive the vehicle on the surface uh, to assist us in the recovery process. And then as we come back to the back of the vehicle, we're really getting involved in the fin control and propulsion system. So once again, the, uh, the vehicle has to be able to drive itself through the water column, and that's a full 3D picture. So it propels itself forward using the propeller and the drive motor, and then it has 2D control over its steering capability with the rudder and its elevation using the elevator fins. So this is used to control the height off the bottom that the vehicle will uh, uh, maintain in order to keep the sensors on the bottom. One of the other sensors that we have on the upper half of the vehicle is a, a CT probe. So this measures conductivity and temperature of the water that the vehicle is flying through. Uh, but one of the derivatives of conductivity and temperature is sound speed. We use sound speed to correct all of the acoustic transmissions off of the vehicle uh, because the speed of sound will actually vary with the density of the water. All right. Go. Okay, the chalk's behind you. So what we've done now is we've actually rolled the vehicle. So now it's, it's upside down as you're viewing it now. But this is where all the important sensors are for imaging and navigating across the bottom. Once again, from front to back, we have a forward-looking sonar. So this sonar here, and once again, when I say sonar, it's using sound to detect something, um, projects itself out in front of the vehicle. And if an object comes into its field of view that the vehicle might want to avoid, this is what tells the vehicle to start climbing if the bottom comes close. This cavity here, we actually have a drop weight that put, fits in there. So that is made to have a reserve weight. So when the vehicle ends its mission, it'll actually drop this weight and allow it to ascend through the water column a little bit faster. This is once again an acoustic sensor. This is what we call the Doppler velocity log. So this is using four acoustic beams to enable measurement, precise measurement, of the vehicle's movement and height across the bottom. So this is a navigation sensor. This is the xenon strobe. We use the strobe 
for lighting for the camera images. Uh, much like the flash of a, of a camera, a xenon strobe, what it does is it produces a, a very intense, very powerful amount of light for a very short amount of time. So just the amount of time that the camera exposure is on, this light will illuminate the bottom. And we use a strobe versus constant illumination because it conserves power. So it's a much more efficient way of putting lots of light in the ocean for a very short time cycle, but yet, once again, we are power limited. It conserves our battery power. Here is the actual camera dome. So this is a really thick piece of glass with a camera lens behind it. Um, and as you look, of course, we are trying to survive all of that pressure at depth. So as uh, all the pressure casings in the vehicle are made, this piece of glass can go to 6,000 meters without crushing behind it. And once again, we have another acoustic trans transponder for our navigation and communication purposes. But one of the main sensors that we're going to utilize for the search uh, is the side scan sonar. If you look down the side of the vehicle here, these black elements or arrays are the side scan transducers. Once again, side scan sonar is projecting sound out from the vehicle at up to 700 meters of range to map the bottom. And you know, we'll go through more about side scan sonar, but essentially what it's doing is it's looking at the direct return of the sound as well as the non-return of the sound to produce a contrast map of the bottom, which gives us an idea of objects, geology, and bottom composition. 